Welcome everyone um, to the Virginia Cooperative Extension Plant Clinic, All About Veggies. Uh, these plant clinics are sponsored by the Virginia Cooperative Extension program of Virginia's two land grant universities, uh, Virginia Tech and Virginia State University. These plant clinics are staffed by master gardeners from the Fairfax County Master Gardeners Association, and we share science-based information about gardening and horticulture topics. We really tried to uh, craft this year's virtual plant clinics to be a full year planning series for your garden uh, to try new things, you know, plan from when you put your first seeds in the ground to when you put your garden to bed for the year. I'll turn it over to Roseanne tonight to start with our bug watch. So Roseanne, could you tell us a little bit about the squash borer and what- Yes, Caitlin, thank you very much. Yeah, this week's bug spotlight is on the squash vine borer. Um, it's aptly named since it, it bores into the stems of the squash plant. And these, the moths of this borer emerge in May and they deposit their eggs on the plants, mostly in the stems near the base of the plant. This is a significant pest in the summer winter squash family and also for pumpkins. It is a native bug to North America, which, oh, you know, nobody else, we can't blame anybody else for it. And it's found proud found primarily on the East Coast, which I found kind of interesting. Very rarely, you're gonna find this insect damaging melons, gourds, and cucumber plants. So if you're growing those, not to worry. The borer larva damages the plant by tunneling into the stems for a, up about um, four weeks or so. And you can recognize this because of what's called the frass. It's, actually the excrement of the larva that it leaves behind. And then once it's damaged the inside of the stem, the plant runner or vine will wilt and that can result in the entire plant dying. So if you're having, if you've had problems with this insect before, chances are pretty high that you're gonna have a recurrence. So you want to try to manage these through cultural and some chemical controls. So what are some of these control methods? We have a couple, monitoring them. So you wanna watch for the moss from mid-May to mid-June, inspect your plants for any eggs. Um, you're gonna see an entrance at the base of the vine for the larva. So that could be an indication and also looking for that frass. Um, culturally, you wanna plant early and it actually is best to use transplants because they're already somewhat established. You can also wrap the lower stems with foil, which helps to deter the larva. And lastly, for the monitoring, for the culture, you can also protect them with fabric until they're, they're flowering. So those, that's using those floating row covers that you put over them. And chemically, uh, you can spray the base of the plant with uh, pyrethins, okay, mid-May, mid to late May, um, but you wanna repeat this in that about 14 days to be sure you've got good coverage. You can also sprinkle the lower stems with a diatomaceous earth, which is actually called DE in some circles, but it's an all natural product made from aquatic plant fossils. So you wanna be sure if you purchase this, you get the food grade DE because it's also used more commercially, but the DE version does not harm any worms or beneficial microorganisms. So that's a good thing. Otherwise, you also have some nematodes that have been used to provide the same level of control as some of your conventional uh, pesticides. Or you can refer to the pest management guide that can be found through uh, the Fairfax Master Gardener Organization website, okay, for 2022 for any recommended insecticides but you want to be sure whatever you do as far as insecticides, read all the instructions and wear any protective gear if necessary. Okay, and these should be applied early in the season so you can kill the larva before they actually start burrowing. So I had a couple resources that I used and I found them very helpful. Okay, so Penn State Extension, University of Maryland Extension, uh, University of Connecticut, and then also uh, University of Florida. So those are just a few of the resources that you can check out for more information about this board. Okay, back to you, Caitlin. Thank you so much, Roseanne. Really appreciate that. It's a really informative uh, presentation and lots to look out for in our gardens. 
So I'm going to turn it over to Susan McCracken next to talk about hot peppers. So Susan, over to you. Hey, thanks, Caitlin. Yeah, we're going to talk about hot peppers tonight and encourage you to spice up your life a little bit and jump into hot peppers. Even though it might be something you're afraid of, there are a lot of good options out there for you. So let's start with some pepper facts. Peppers belong to the capsaicin species and are members of the Solanaceae or nightshade family. So that puts peppers in the same family as potatoes, eggplant, tomatoes, and petunias. Uh, peppers are technically berries. That fruit is actually um, a berry. Now, though peppers are annuals here because they're you know, not cold tolerant at all, they're actually perennials in parts of the world in Central America, Bolivia, and Peru. And there they can live up to 10 years. Now, peppers are started green, and so all green peppers are actually unripe peppers. They will eventually ripen to, to color. Pepper plants do better if you give them some support, stake them or put a cage around them. Uh, most peppers are classified according to their shape and their degree of mild or hot flavor. You might be interested to know that they're native to the Americas not just North America, South America. And records show they were actually grown in the Americas and Hispaniola as early as 3500 BC. Columbus sort of discovered them when he arrived here looking for black pepper and other spices when he landed in the Americas. Once discovered, they were spread around the world by the Portuguese as they followed their trade routes. They brought different kinds of peppers to India, China, Europe, and Southeast Asia, where the cooks quickly learn to add them to their foods, both as flavor enhancements and as food preservatives. Hot peppers can be cooked, can be eaten fresh, can be stored in a refrigerator for, but say, up to a, a week. You can actually preserve them by freezing them as well as pickling or drying them. To grow them, you're going to want full sun at least six hours a day. You want that soil to be well-drained, loose. They don't like to sit in water. They want their their feet um, to be able to grow without being soggy. The, um, the soil needs to be like medium rich, about a pH of 5.5 to 6.5. They like it warm. They want temperatures 70 to 75 at least. For moisture, you don't want to water overwater them. They don't want, want to be dry, but they don't want to be wet. So it's an average watering. If you're transplanting, you set them out after that soil has thoroughly warmed up, like we've got pretty good conditions now, so you could uh, put your uh, plants in now. If you wanted to start seed, then you think about this for next year, because you want to back up six to eight weeks to start your seeds indoors for transplanting about this time when the soil is warm. You're going to plant them 18 to 24 inches apart, and if you're doing rows, those rows are going to be 30 to 36 inches apart. Don't over fertilize them. It's a light to medium fertilizer. If you over fertilize them, you're going to get a lot of green luscious growth, but you're not going to get much in the way of fruit. It's going to focus on those leaves. Also be a little patient because peppers, while you might think of them as, as a summer fruit, they really don't ripen good until August or September. Now, the degree in peppers is determined by several uh, compounds called capsaicinoids. These are not only determined by the variety of pe pepper, but also by the growing conditions. Even on that same plant, cooler weather produces milder peppers. The longer the fruit is on the plant, the more mild that pepper can be. Not universal truth, but common truth. The time of the year, the amount of daylight, the temperature all affect a pepper's heat. The, the heat is rated on a Scoville heat unit scale. The Scoville scale is a measurement of the pungency or spiciness or heat of the chili peppers. And it's recorded as the Scoville heat units, SHU. This is based on the concentration of those capsaicinoids, among which capsaicin, capsaicin is the predominant compound. Now, interestingly enough, this scale is named after its creator, an American pharmacist called Wilbur Scoville. So we're going to go through some different varieties, and we're going to start with the least hot and end up with the most hot. And we start with shoshito. It's a small, mild Japanese pepper for roasting, pan frying, or grilling. Occasionally, this pepper is going to display heat. But 
mostly this is a pretty mild one. It's typically harvested and used green. So you can see here, the, just to the right, that's the Shoshito. Uh, it eventually can turn orange and red with a sweeter flavor. Um, the, the SHUs on this is 100 to 1,000, pretty mild. Then you have your poblano on the lower left. It's a fairly thin walled black green fruit that fully ripens to red. Now this is one where, um, this is great for stuffing for chilies, such as chili rellenos and sauteing. Um, this is one though that the longer it stays on and the redder it gets, the hotter it gets. Uh, and this can go anywhere from about an SHU of 250 to about 1500. The Anaheim looks like a, an Italian roasting pepper, but it's, it has a little bit of a kick. It has a great sweet flavor with some heat and it's very popular in Southwest and Mexican, Mexican cuisines. And it's a really nice added to sauces. And this is one you can stuff also. SHU on this, 500 to 2,500. The Hungarian hot wax just sounds hot to me. It's a larger pepper and it ranges in colors from yellow to orange to red. Great for pickling with actually a mild to medium heat, only um, SHUs of 1,000 to 5,000 plus. Jalapenos um, are a medium spiciness. We're, most of us, I think, are, are familiar with jalapenos um, and might be surprised to find out it is just medium spiciness, but it can get a, anywhere from sweet to a little more spicy. Thicker walled fruits are usually about three and a half to four inches. You can pick them green and smooth and, or allow them to ripen until they get small cracks in the skin, or you can pick them when they're all the way red. SHU on these, about 4,000 to 6,000. Serrano's, one of my favorites when cooking, <laughs> not eating, <laughs> are thinner walled fruit ripen from green to red. They're smaller and thinner than jalapenos, but um, they're often used in spicy Mexican dishes, uh, chutneys, curries, sauces, and marinades. SHU on these about 4,000 to up to 16,000. Oh, a cayenne. Everybody loves a cayenne. cayenne. It has this great flavor on that first bite, and then you get that lingering warmth, warm heat. Uh, read between the lines on that one. It's thick enough for a bit of crunch when you eat it fresh, but it really dries easily and it makes an excellent powder. Uh, makes, also makes flakes um, and it's good in hot sauce, but you can also uh, use it fried or in stir fries. SHU on this, 5,000 to 60,000. The Aleppo is popular in Middle Eastern and Mediterranean regions. It's, it's small, only several inches long and maybe up to an inch wide. And it's moderately hot and it has really good fruity undertones. Uh, this is one where you want it to redden before you use. You want it to mature to red bef before you pick it. This is traditionally used dry and it's crushed or, or crushed into flakes. SHU on this about 10,000. The Bangkok Thai hot pepper. This is a fiery hot cayenne pepper and the fruit is small elongated red chilies. You can use it both green and red. Uh, you can dry it for hot pepper flakes or use it in many restaurants. This, is, this pepper is really good in Asian dishes. SHU on this one, about 50,000 to 100,000. So we're really moving up there. And finally, our habanero is an extremely pungent uh, wrinkled fruit. It's only about two inches by one and a quarter. So it's a small, wide little fruit and it ripens to a beautiful salmon orange extremely spicy with fruity flavor. Um, it's a key ingredient in Jamaican jerk sausages, uh, sauces. The SHU on this one is 100,000 to 350,000. My brother-in-law gave me one last year and I never had the nerve to try it. So I probably missed out on something wonderful. So if you're looking for plants for your garden this year and you're willing to be a little adventuresome, uh, look for some of these peppers and to find them, you might want to look at farmer's markets because many vendors will grow a larger variety of, of peppers than you might find in the big box stores. And you can also try some of your local garden centers to see what they have. It's not too late to get started. Now's a great time to plant them. Enjoy. And I hope you spice up your life. Um, and here are some of the references used for this. 
So Caitlin, I will turn this back to you. Liz had a question. Is the shishito milder when it's red? Is it milder than a pimento? Um, shishitos don't really get hotter when they're red. Um, pimentos only uh, range from about, fifth, about 500 to 1,000 Schofield units. And shishitos are, what were they? They were the, the, the milder, so they were in the 100 to 1,000. So they're close. Okay. Thank you. I hope that helps. That was a great presentation, Susan. Thank you so much for that overview. I think a lot of us have some exciting new pepper varieties to consider for our garden. So um, our next presenter is Liz. So Liz, I'll turn it over to you. You have some fantastic information to share about summer squash. Um, so Liz, without any further ado, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Caitlin. <clears throat> yes, my mic's on, okay. <laughs> so um, I'm talking about summer squash and the um, Latin name is Percubita pepo. There's many varieties. Uh, mainly you would see um, zucchini, green or yellow, uh, a straight or Crook necks squash, with a, which a lot of times can be both yellow and zucchini, patty plant pan squash, which is the whitish one that's in the front there, and any squash with a thin edible skin. Um, I discovered one a couple years ago um, called, I'm forgetting its name, but it's huge. I mean, it literally was about four and a half, five feet tall with a bulb on the end, but it was also a summer squash. Oh, it's called trum trumpetta. But if you left it on the vine long enough, it became a winter squash because the end of the um, skin got really hard. So it was just kind of interesting. So as is most squashes, summer squash really loves heat. And you can start it by um, putting seeds in the ground when the ground is warm, or you can start your seeds ahead of time and put the uh, plants in the ground uh, when it's warm. They are highly projective. Um, many times, depending on you know, how many people you're growing for, you don't need more than one or two plants because they continue to produce, of course, unless you get some of the um, the tests, the pests that were already talked about. It's, it's one of those plants that requires a lot of nutrients uh, all summer. If you're growing summer squash, it pre pre prefers a slightly acidic soil and it's in the pH range of 6.0 to 6.5. It re really likes some kind of a compost or a well-rotted manure and maybe compressed, uh, composted shredded leaves. Well, also, if you, if you put that around the plant, many times it'll supply enough nutrients for the whole season. And depending on your soil, it's good to periodically do a soil test and add any um, nutrients that might be recommended for your gardening soil. So again, I already talked about that they can be uh, started by seed or to use plants with su a su sufficient root system. And again, the soil, it's best if it's at 70 degrees for it to be consistently good. Uh, packet, uh, most plants nowadays you can buy as very compact bush types, but there's also some that will spread through um, long, long vines as well. You need about 36 inches, inches between plants and you need full sun. It's good to mulch around the bottom of the plants so that um, the spreading stems don't get in contact with the wet soil because that will cause uh, more disease. So if you look at the anatomy of the plant, the, squ the squash have separate male and female flowers. And the First ones that come out are your male flowers and they come out on a, a slender stem and they will drop off of the plant first. If you can catch them on the day that they bloom, you can eat the male flowers and it does not affect the, the plant. The female flowers, <clears throat> which open later, they grow, grow very close to the vine and you're gonna see that <clears throat> they have a, a swelling at the um, vine and that turns into your fruit or into your squash. These are a common squash pollinator that, that moves the um, pollen from male flowers to female flowers. <clears throat> so you want to pick summer squash earlier rather than later. The smaller squashes are going to be more tender and tasty. I a lot of time have picked the larger squashes, but I might grate them more than I would slice them up for uh, cooking. 
Um, you want to, I already said this, but you want to harvest the blossoms on the day they bloom, preferably the male ones. Take large squash off the vine. Like if you forget to pick one, you don't want to let it sit on the vine because it will reduce the productivity of the plant itself. Um, be careful not to disturb the plant as you harvest. That opens you up for uh, more damage by insects and disease. And, um, you know, don't harvest when things are wet because that just uh, sp spreads more disease. <clears throat> squash have um, very long tap roots and branching surface roots that help access soil moisture. Uh, make sure that um, you don't, that, that you soak your soil and not the leaves thoroughly when you're watering. You know, if you just put a little bit of water on, it's not gonna do as well as if, if you soak it because the roots uh, go pretty long. Vine crops need to be about, need about one inch of water or rainfall every week during the growing season. You wanna keep your leaves dry. Do not plant the plant with, excuse me, do not spray, spray the plant with a hose. Use a, a drip hose, a soaker hose, or carefully water the soil under the leaves. Tallest plants are gonna always need more water. And the seedlings are vulnerable to damping off where they basically, I, I think it's like a rotting of the vine when they're in anything that's cold or wet. So I'm a little worried because I put in some squats last week. And with this weather that we've been having the last couple of days, I'm concerned about the plants that I put in then. Powdery mildew is a fungal disease that you will see on squash. And if you look at the picture on the right, you might be familiar with that. It just, um, it's like a little bit of a, a white, almost like a white dusting on the leaves. Other things are brown spots, tattered leaves, sunken brown lesions on vines, and rotted fruit can be from fungal leaf spot and fruit rot diseases. <clears throat> Viruses can also affect um, summer squash and spread to other plants in the garden. That's why, especially when things are wet, you don't want to touch the wet leaves and then touch another plant because you could be uh, sending a disease you know, to another place. The other thing is that the viruses can overwinter in any of the weeds or anything that are in that same area. So if you see any uh, damaged leaves, you should discard them rather than um, recompost them. And then again, if you use good cultural control practices, you're going to avoid a lot of diseases, such as really removing all dead and diseased plant material and watering the soil and not the plant. All right, eating summer squash. <clears throat> so the skin, the seeds, and the flowers are all edible. If you're cooking them, there's many ways to do that. You can just um, boil with water, saute with onion and other vegetables, or um, breaded and pan fried. They can go in casseroles or lasagna. And I've done this before. You kind of bread and pan fry them as a meat substitute. And I, a lot of times, uh, use something like wheat germ or and anything that's got some texture to it. Um, shredded and grated is great in salads and baked goods such as zucchini. Uh, somebody earlier was saying it works really well if you mix it with hamburger or turkey meat, uh, makes the meat very moist. You can also make zoodles, which is like uh, those machines that make like spaghetti noodles out of squash. Um, and it's also good frozen, pickled, dehydrated, and, and canned. There, and if, if you're into dehydration, there's a really great Facebook group on dehydra dehydrating vegetables. And the people on there are really active and have some really great ideas for dehydration of vegetables. Um, this is some of the resources I use. And if you look at the very first one from um, Cornell University, it's actually a huge variety uh, it was like over a hundred varieties of squash. So I thought that might be interested if anybody um, wanted to look at that. one. So thanks very much. Thank you so much, Liz. That was a fabulous presentation. Great overview and great ideas. Our final third and final present presenter tonight. Wow, I still can't talk. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> is Mark Kiefer and Mark is here to talk about winter squash. So Mark, I'm going to stop talking and turn it over to you. Uh, hi, I'm Mark Kiefer. I'm a master gardener with the Fairfax County Master Garden Gardener Group. And I've been vegetable gardening 
vegetable gardening for a number of years and only started growing winter squash, a couple of varieties, uh, three years ago. So I've got some experience and had some failures and successes uh, that I'd like to share with you today. Oh, the photo on the right is from my garden last July showing a, a butternut squash and a delicata. Uh, I'm going to give an overview, a brief description of what we mean when we talk, say, winter squash. Uh, I'll talk about planting and growing, uh, problems encountered with winter squash, and harvesting and storage, and then a list of resources at the end. Uh, winter squash is a, a broad category in the genus Cucurbita. There's a wide variety of types and flavors. I, on the right box, it gives a list uh, of examples, very you know, commonly known. I highlighted uh, butternut and delicata because I've, I've grown those. So the experience I'm sharing is, is based on, on that. Uh, one characteristic, it's not all winter squash, but many is the skin can be tough and less sweet. Uh, most take a, a while to mature, 75 to 120 days. Uh, and my experience with the butternut squash last year is that it went on and on. I, I was successful, but uh, it was more toward the 120 days, I think. Uh, they're characterized in most cases by sprawling vines, 10 to 20 feet long. If you let them go, they keep going. So space is a, a factor and a, a wide range of weights, uh, one to 75 pounds. And I think it's probably the pumpkins that are the, are the ones that get up to 75 pounds. Uh, another characteristic of uh, winter squash as opposed to summer squash is that most store well, uh, some for months, and that has been my experience. I've got one uh, butternut squash still to eat, and they, they did quite well in storage for the most part. Planting and growing. Well, it, it, it's too small to read, sorry about that, but I put uh, in the upper right corner uh, an image of the back of a seed packet. So. Uh, a couple of times I've done presentations about growing vegetables is I remind people to read the seed packet and some seed packets have more detailed information than others, but you could usually look up information at the seed supplier site. The basic information should all be there. So that's a great reference because you've got it right in your hand. Uh, it doesn't mean you can't look, look it up on the web or someplace or in a book, but that's a, a reminder that the, the guidelines are, are, are well described on the packet itself and the front and the back. As described by Liz in her presentation on summer squash, the soil and sun requirements are similar. They like a lot of sun. And that's one experience I had the first year I grew the butternut squash and delicata, I didn't even know it was mixed in at that time. It grew okay. I, I got maybe less than 10, you know, eight to 10 squash, I think. And one of the reasons it, it wasn't more successful is because it wasn't getting enough sun. Uh, I think it had enough space to grow. So the sun uh, is a factor uh, and moving it to a sunnier spot last year, you saw on the front page, it, it was very happy. Needs ample space or sturdy vertical structures. So you want to, if you don't have a lot of space, you want to try to find varieties that are compact and compact, you know, in the winter squash family doesn't necessarily mean small. So keep that in mind, you know, how much space are you really going to need, even if it's a smaller variety. Um, and I'll show a picture of some structures on another slide. In the lower right, you can, I've just planted my seeds about a week ago. And again, sorry, this 
slide isn't easy to see, but I this spot is about 10 feet by 20 feet, roughly, and it's slightly sloped. I didn't actually build up the small hills, but they're slightly raised. But more often than not, with the butternut squash, you'll see, and, and I think this is similar with zucchini, you know, plant fire, you know, do a little mound, you know, not too high, and plant five or six, uh, five or six seeds uh, in a group. Uh, the three feet apart is an error that applies to summer squash and, and that can even be a bit close for that, but uh, you need a wider spacing with uh, with winter squash, with particular butternut squash. Um, so sorry about the error there. After you see the sprouts come up and they usually uh, germinate and sprout quite well. Uh, I always hate to pull up seedlings. You know, you feel like they're your children or something, your babies, but you'll regret it if you don't thin them because if they're, they start growing again, they keep growing and they get all entangled. So you, it gets too dense to work with. So thin, thin it to one or two, and then maybe down the one, uh, the healthiest one. Uh, and they usually come up uh, within a week, uh, uh, you know, before this this wet, cooler weather hit today, uh, they got going. So I think I'm going to be okay. Uh, they like water, like to be kept moist. As Liz said, and this is kind of good practice across the board: water the soil, not the foliage, because getting the foliage too wet can lead to disease. Um, that can be challenging with a with squash a little bit because they're so they're viney and tangled, but uh, be be a little bit cautious there. Again, uh, I don't use a lot of fertilizer. I'm trying to build my soil to be fertile, and I add I added blood meal. Uh, Mick worked it in the soil carefully because uh, large amounts can be bad. Uh, to, as a nitrogen source, because my other elements are pretty good, but you want to consider putting some compost down and uh, using a organic fertilizer. Uh, continuing on planting and growing, uh, you want to keep them moist down to depth of six inches. Again, to, to keep them moist, but don't overwater. Uh, but in these hot summers in our area, you need to to keep a an eye on that, particularly if you, you sign, of course, as you see them drooping a bit. Um, the critical period for, for good, even moisture is during fruit set, and fruit development. Um, you can do some pinching and pruning of squash. I haven't done the pinching, to be honest, but that can, you know, if, depending on the space you've got, that can to broad, you know, widen the, the plant out a bit and give you more uh, fruit bearing shoots. Uh, the pruning, uh, he, here it mentions pruning flowers. You know, after you've got a good set of fruit showing that are, are at the point where, where they're gonna start ripening, you, you can start taking the, some of the flowers off so that the energy is concentrating on supporting the the fruit that's already out. I had a lot last year, and I think I'd probably do more, more flower pruning this year just to reduce the, the harvest a bit and, and what you're worrying about keeping, keeping healthy. Uh, another pruning you can do, which is what I did, is to, is to prune because they're getting too darn big and overtaking other beds. Uh, on the right, you know, I mentioned space and structures. I'm not using the, the vertical A-frame thing, I bought a fancy thing this year versus a do-it-yourself. I'm gonna grow uh, summer squash on that A-frame. On the right, I've got cucumbers, a row on uh, either parallel side uh, toward the edge. I, I have a PVC structure and you can see the netting I'm gonna attach to the PVC pipe on, on the left. So those are examples of structures that can be used in, in a raised bed. Uh, you probably would, with the zucchini, you might need to do some pruning as well as with the cucumber, but uh, that's a way to conserve space and get them going up 
instead of going all, all different directions. Once you start fruiting, there's, there's some, I didn't do this myself, but it, it, a good practice can be to put a, a board or a flat rock under the fruit to separate it from the bare soil, or you can put uh, a good mulch layer underneath to protect it uh, from uh, soil-borne diseases. Uh, common problems, I'm happy that uh, the vine borer was covered earlier because that is uh, talking about the pests and the metal. Uh, below, you see a victim of a vine borer. That's a, that might be a delicata squash, but what happens, or, or I appreciate that's a, a winter squash picture from a few years ago. You can have a plant that's going gangbusters and looking beautiful and not being keep, keeping a close eye out for vine borers and the plant will suddenly collapse on you. This is, this is what happens if the vine borer is left un, unattended. Um, so I've just got lists here of common diseases and common pests. Uh, I'm not gonna go into, you know, mitigation or prevention of these, but these are the common things to watch out for. Uh, and a couple of which were mentioned uh, in the earlier presentation on zucchini, on summer squash. Uh, some, uh, this is mostly cultural controls I've got in the right hand, rotate crops, uh, I, we all say this, you know, good vegetable garden, you got to rotate, but in backyard gardening, you don't usually have a lot of, you know, big space, particularly for something like winter squash. So it's, it's good to try to rotate across beds, but if you, even in, in a large backyard, that is a practical matter, isn't easy, but it is good practice because as Liz said, the certain diseases and pests will hang out and be there the next year. So that's just something I'm aware of. I know I'm gonna have a problem with, particularly with vine borer, uh, it's been my nemesis, but uh, I, I can't, I don't have the space to do a lot of rotation. We control, you know, common good cultural practice, uh, particularly around the plants, because those, those can compete with the plants and harbor, uh, uh, insects that you don't want. Uh, floating row covers uh, were mentioned earlier. That's a way to keep pests out. And here pests include dogs or cats that like to run around in your garden and dig holes. The one issue with row covers is to not use them in high heat because it, it can cook, cook your vegetable, you know, it can, can, can get too hot uh, later in the summer uh, as a practical matter. Monitoring and, and picking off insects. Um, I've got, I'm retired, so I've got more time to do that, but uh, that's something that can be pretty labor intensive, but it can really help because then you're aware of what's active and you can find a treatment or you can just keep plucking them off off the vines in particular. Uh, the barriers under ripening fruit I mentioned, bulge or a flat rock or a board to separate it from the soil. The cleanup of debris uh, both during the growth period and after, after harvest is important because that can, can carry disease uh, during the growth period and uh, the next season if, if you don't clean up. Um, this last point is depending on what you've got, this is kind of a very general bit of advice. You can, you know, if you got something that's really gonna damage your, your fruit, your, your, your production, you can consult with the, our help desk or with the literature on, you know, once you know what the disease or pest is, you can consider use of organic or industrial type uh, pest and pest controls. I, I'm not gonna go into any specifics today because of time, but that's something you should know what it is. You know, seek expert advice if you can, 
and make sure you're applying the proper control, whether it's organic or, or not. Talking about butternut squash on the right, you see some of the output that's from November. So with butternut squash, you can leave it on the vine as it's maturing for a long time. In fact, it's, it's recommended to do that because it will cause it to, to sweeten as long as it's not getting too wet or showing rot or other diseases. I left these on a long time and they were good. You know, 90% were good. And I didn't use any pest control. I did have problems with fine bores, but harvest the fruit when I, you can allow it as, as, as differentiated from uh, the summer squash here, leaving it on the vine is, is, is a good thing because you don't want to pick it too early because it will be tougher and less sweet. Uh, one test with a butternut squash or the harder skin squash is uh, using your fingernail. And if it's hard for you to cut the skin with your fingernail, that means it's probably mature. The other thing I see on butternut squash, you see kind of green stripes coming down from the top, the, the vine stem side down, uh, the fruit. He, you want to see the, that, you know, much uh, color to the nice squash color. Uh, the cutting, uh, and Liz mentioned the handling too, is you want to harvest when, when the fruit is dry, the ground, you know, ground is dry, and you want to cut the vine so that you got a couple inches left because if the vine breaks off, it's an entry point for disease, even as the squash it is curing. I mentioned harvest when dry and keep dry. You do want to kind of brush off the loose soil and stuff, but don't like scrub it down and, you know, with, with soap or anything at that point, but clean it up and clean up enough so you're not creating a mess as you move it around. And then later, you know, after it's been in storage, again, you got to find a place to store it that your spouse isn't going to complain about the mess. Um, then you, you know, when you're ready to prepare it for cooking, you want to scrub it thoroughly with a brush to get all the dirt off. So curing, so after you've harvested, they, these in the picture, I left outside, you know, I said November, uh, it says cure for 10 days at 80, 85 degrees. Well, I didn't, I didn't do that. It was pretty warm in November probably. So I've got a temperature range there that I found in a good extension service publication, but that's kind of a, a you know, ideal to get it good and cured. And then you can put it in storage uh, at a cooler temperature. Again, I didn't store the squash I had, but it did fine. I just had a couple that got a little bit mushy uh, in parts, but I was able to cut that away and use most of the, the vegetables. So I put them in a, dark unused room that had a sink in it and I had bins and they did fine. It's probably more like 60, 65 degrees in that room. So that was a pretty quick skim through winter squash. And here are resources I'd recommend. I put the Rodale's encyclopedia at the top because I made heavy use of that. It's a great publication but equally valuable and informative are extension service uh, publications of North Carolina State, Clemson, and of course, Virginia Tech at the bottom shows planning guide dates and, and so forth. That's a good, good reference. So that's it. Thank you, Mark. That was fabulous. So. Um detailed and a lot to think about. And I think that's a really great intro for a lot of us who are thinking about trying some winter squash in our garden, who are lucky enough to have the space to do it. Liz asked, if you trim a branch squash plant, does it, so it doesn't spread so much, will that reduce the number of squash produced? Yes. Okay. That was and, very and, simple. And the way to look at this is we've all ended up with I mean, it's easy to give stuff away too, but it's a question of space, how much space you've got, how much you want to keep in store, but also that can 
you can get better results, you know, because the energy isn't being consumed by so many, so many fruit. So that's not not unique to squash, but that's also a consideration. Is it it allows you might get a lower harvest, but higher quality harvest. Okay, that's that's good advice. So next one was from Caitlin. Um, she asks Mark or and Liz, do you have any experience or advice about hand pollinating the squash? Liz, do you want to take that? I haven't done that. I've read about it and haven't had to do it, but you, you mentioned that. I think well, I, I know that I've um, only seen that on video. I, I have not done that myself, but when I saw the video, I was really amazed at how easy it looked. I've just never done it, so I don't really have experience. So if, you know, I would suggest, you know, seeing if they could look it up on a... Um, an extension site might have something about that. Apart from the squash borer, are there any other insects that might be an issue for squash? I know, um, Mark, you mentioned the squash bug. Liz, what about you? So I have a slide that I can show. So this is a continuation of um, problems that, that they have. And a lot of times, if you have rain and and cloudy weather like we have now in the middle of plants putting out uh, flowers and fruit, they're not gonna set very well. Uh, I've had that same experience myself. Also the squash itself, you know, too much water can make it not taste as well. But in regard to insects, there's um, squash bugs. And if you look on that top picture, that's a picture of one. In my experience, most of the ones that I've seen have more of a, a brown exterior and look a little bit like stink bugs. Um, the squ squash, um, squash vine borers, we've already seen some pictures of that, but that's what's on the bottom right. Um, I do have experience of removing those. <laughs> I tried it last year. I had two plants. I cut into the vine. I removed them. And then the indirect directions I said was to cover them with water, I mean dirt. So um, both plants lived and one of them continued to produce, but the other one didn't. Um, and I just, I don't think I'll do it again because it was really gross, but um, it was a great experience to see that it could be done. And I, I apparently got all of them out that was in that one plant. And I'm assuming the one that didn't do well was the, that didn't produce probably didn't. Um, and I didn't put a picture up here, but there's these striped cucumber beetles and I know that I see them every year. And I'm, I think that they um, don't just go after the succurbits. I think they go after of some other things. And then I just put a list of some of the others that you might see. Leaf miners, aphids, cutworms, cucumber beetles, mole crickets, and fruit worms are others that you just might see. Um, I'm also an advocate of um, using diatomaceous earth um, a lot of times try that first before I might use something on our, um, I forget what it's called, but our list of approved chemicals. Um, and I've successfully gotten rid of some things, but not everything. Oh, that's good, good to know. Yeah. Um, one question for Susan, um, I don't think you addressed it, was, would be any pests that bother, bother the pepper plants? Yeah, there are a few pests, some I'm not really familiar with. There's a pepper, a uh, weevil and a pepper hornworm. I don't think I've actually seen those. More common ones are like aphids, flea beetles, spider mites, and thrips. You'll see little holes in your leaves and, and you flip the leaf up and you'll, you'll often, if they're big enough to see, some of those aren't big enough to see, but like aphids you can see. Um, so yeah, there are a few out there. I, I think peppers are, the ones I've grown or seem to, to do to fare a little better. Um, but if you've got some holes and stuff, you need to start looking for those and see if you can identify uh, any of those pests. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for that. Caitlin, back to you. Well, thank you, everyone. Like we said, um, just fabulous presentations tonight. Really appreciate the overviews. That's going to be really helpful information for our local gardeners as they're planning their gardens this year. So, um, Roseanne, I think we had one question from our guest. I was wondering if I could turn it over to you to answer this one. Sure, um, I believe it was from Allison, okay? So she wanted to know how she fertilizes her small raised vegetable garden. 
Well, first of all, remember that fertilizing will only help if you have a lack of nutrients in the soil and that's causing a problem. So you always wanna do a soil test first, okay? To determine if you need to fertilize and what you need. Um, there's organic fertilizers such as bone meal, granite dust, fish emulsion. Um, and I know Mark mentioned that he uses some of these and puts them into his soil, which is outstanding. Um, also the composting um, and adding a top dressing that's slow release. And then again, during the season, you want lots of organic matter such as the crumbled up leaves and uh, rotted manure, things like that that are gonna add those nutrients to the soil. Um, you can use an inorganic one, which is the man-made you know, powders, liquids, et cetera. But if you can go natural, that's much better. Um, nitrogen, you're going to want for you know, adding green color and it provides the protein. But again, as someone mentioned, if you add too much, that can actually kill your plant. Um, phosphorus is used for the cell division and the fruit and plant uh, flower formation. So you want to make sure you've got that. And, but if you get too much, you can have stungent growth for flowering and fruit. Um, same for po potassium and that provides some of the chemical processes that are involved in living and growing. So if you have deficiency in that, again, you might have yellow leaves, stunted growth. Um, you can, depending upon how big your garden is, you can either do broadcast fertilizing before planting, similar to what Mark mentioned about digging it down into the soil, mixing it in real well. And that's an excellent start for your garden. Um, you can add a starter fertilizer in there is a good thing too. Um, you can do a row application. So when you make those rows, you kind of build a little tunnel on either side of it and you can apply um, fertilizer to those strips and then water down. Again, you wanna make sure it's not too much. Um, so you're gonna to wanna to look at those numbers again. Um, if you're transplanting those tomatoes and peppers and stuff, you can make a little solution of two tablespoons of garden fertilizer in a one gallon water and stir it well and then pour a cup of that into those channels alongside the vegetables. And that's going to give them nutrients but not right on them. So as they start growing um, or you can sprinkle some fertilizer along the side rows and then water it into the soil. So there's a lot of um, suggestions out there. Uh, I found a couple of YouTube channels that are videos that were also very helpful. So um, what about you other master gardeners? What do you think? Any suggestions from your experience? Roseanne, I think that sounds great. That's great advice. Sorry, Mark, if you were gonna jump in here. Oh, I, you started with the soil test. Uh, based on my own experience, having built the soil, you can get surprising results and see that you don't need to add any P or, or K. You can see you've already got high or very high presence of some elements. So the soil test for me was a surprise and very educational. And that's why I mentioned, yeah, you know, this was from the Virginia Tech. They said nitrogen, nitrogen only. And I chose, and what you need to be careful with that because it's, you can overpower, but uh, it's, it's a very valuable thing to start with. So you're not wasting money on you know fertilizer mixes that you might not need and concentrating on what the real soil needs are well thank you mark thank you roseanne like i said i think that's really great advice for allison to use in her raised bed gardening uh, so i hope that she has good fortune with that um, if you are successful in growing hot peppers and squash in your gardens you might be looking for new ways to use those so if you're interested in trying out some new recipes with your a harvest, this is a great way to start. For those of you who eat dinner late, this could make you very hungry. So one of the other things that we have talked about in our uh, vegetable clinics this year has been keeping a garden journal. And it's a good way to help you keep track of what works, what doesn't, the bugs you see in your garden so that you start to have familiarity with some of these um, you know, concepts and practices that our presenters tonight have walked us through so that you can have the same 
practice that they have developed over years of experience. So um, at the end of the season, we're going to review, kind of talk through how you review your garden journal and what you do with that information into planning next year. Um, and I have a nice template for a garden journal if you're looking for one to use. Right now, um, as we're putting warm weather plants in, like peppers and things like that, um, note what you're seeing. Are they doing well? Are they growing slowly? Are there you know, things eating them? That sort of thing. You can kind of keep track of that and watch for those next season. Um, and then how your spring crops are responding to the very wild weather we've had recently where it you know, pours rain, gets really hot, gets really cold. Uh, we've had a lot of um, ups and downs. So how are your plants responding to that? Um, and finally, are you looking at the structure or layout of, layout of your garden? Do you have room for some of these squash plants? Um, you know, this is a good time to, to note those in your journal.